Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Medical Fitness Podcast. I'm Jeff Young, and my co-host, Dr. Thomas Hammett, will be joining in future episodes. The podcast is brought to you by the Medicine Rehab and Fitness Institute and JY Kinesiology, LLC, both of which are dedicated to medical fitness education and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. You can learn more at mrfinstitute.org. The purpose of our podcast is to provide you with principle and evidence-based content on all things related to exercise science, strength and conditioning, medical fitness, and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. My first guest is Dr. Amy Bantham, president of the Physical Activity Alliance and CEO and founder of Move to Live More. She also holds a doctor of public health degree from Harvard University. As you're about to see and hear, Dr. Bantham is involved with the national movement to increase physical activity and with bridging this gap between medicine and fitness at the highest levels. So I was extremely excited to have her as my first guest. During this interview, Dr. Bantham explains her background and why she has such a passion for physical activity as medicine and connecting the healthcare and fitness fields. And then she goes into detail about things going on in the background at the national and systemic level that I think you should be aware of. So let's get started. All right. I am extremely honored and excited to have as a guest, Dr. Amy Bantham, who is involved in building this bridge between medicine and fitness at the highest level. Welcome, Dr. Bantham, and thanks so much for allowing me the opportunity to pick your brain. I can't wait. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I'm very excited to chat with you. Yep. I'm, I'm so glad. So what I'd like to do before I pass the baton to you and 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 pick your brain and let you t take over, is just give spend like two or three minutes giving some background as to what led up to this, so that the viewers and listeners can have a little bit more clarity, and also so everybody can understand why I'm as excited as I am about this opportunity. And I'll make it I'll make it quick. In 2015, I got involved with uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which you're definitely aware of. Some of the viewers may or may not be. Um, in 2017, I was asked to create and chair what we called a fitness and medicine member interest group for this company, where my primary roles were to provide education on exercise and how to build this bridge between clinicians and fitness professionals. Jump forward to 2018, and I presented at their annual conference in Indianapolis, where one of the things I talked about um, was how private physical therapy practices, and the way I described it was, they're literally medical fitness facilities waiting to happen. And it would be a perfect bridge if between physicians, uh, advanced practice providers, and fitness professionals, if, if patients were moved through this medicine rehab um, fitness continuum more often, which I know from watching uh, your podcast, that this is something that you're passionate about as well. Um, in 2019, while still chairing this medicine and fitness uh, MIG in the ACLM, I was introduced to Jeff Duran, who is the current chair of the board of directors for the Medical Fitness Association. And he's absolutely an all-star in this space. And we started to work on a project where what I wanted to do was create uh, within the ACLM, what I was going to call a patient referral subcommittee. And what, what we were doing is we were meeting pretty much weekly and just talking about all the barriers or, or perceived barriers to referral and what the solutions are. And so we were going to create the subcommittee, but then next thing you know, the pandemic hits and it ruined everything. In 2021, I was asked to chair a special population special interest group for the National Strength and Conditioning Association, where at least part of the theme of this group is, again, to, to build this bridge between clinicians and fitness professionals. A year ago, I co-presented with a um, physical therapist colleague of mine who is also just amazing in this space. His name is Dr. Thomas Hammett, and he, am, he and I presented at the American Physical Therapy Association's combined section meeting for seven hours. It was a seven-hour pre-conference um, uh, presentation on building the bridge between PT and medical fitness. Four months ago, Thomas, myself, and another clinician colleague, Sheila Hobois, who is a physician assistant, 
uh, presented on the same topic, uh, building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness at the ACLM's annual conference in Orlando a month ago. Actually, by the way, we're we're currently creating a CME course on this topic. And so all that led, led up to a month ago, a colleague of mine passed me through email your doctoral thesis, which is titled Perspectives on Exercise Prescription Slash Referrals and Patient Exercise Behavior Change, a Mixed Method Study of Physicians and Exercise Professionals. And I and asked me if I had seen it, and embarrassingly, I had known it. And I'm paging through it and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is, and, and when we met, you know, several weeks ago in uh, our introductory meeting, if I remember correctly, some of the first words out of my mouth were like, I've been experiencing for the last 17 or 18 years, what you did your doctoral thesis on. This is crazy. So, so yeah, that's some background on this whole thing. Hopefully it really explains why I'm so excited about this. So what I'd like to do now is just pass the baton over to you and, Please just, you know, just take over, just tell, tell the viewers your story, what led you to be so passionate about this, what led uh, up to your involvement. You can talk about your company, Move to Live More, and then we'll just kind of go on from there. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm so flattered and honored that you took the time to read my 100-page doctoral thesis. Now, I, it's <laughs> and I took you, a bunch of notes on it, too. <laughs> you and my family and some of my classmates and my uh, doctoral committee. So, um, But I've been able to present on my doctoral thesis many times and to distill those 100 pages down into really actionable steps, which is, I think, what what you and I care about. Yes, yes, there are barriers. We want to overcome and address those barriers. And we want to make this information actionable for the communities that we work with and on behalf of. And so my story really starts well, decades ago, like like yours, I am a fitness professional. I'm incredibly passionate about being a fitness professional. I started teaching group exercise in the mid 90s. Um, that is that was my entry into really caring about healthcare and health and fitness integration. I still teach. I taught this morning. And in fact, I just got back from teaching. That and is so awesome. Yeah, and it's it's really a great way for me to keep my finger on the pulse to to talk yes. with students about what they need, what they're looking for to understand the trends in the industry. And um, so I, I still love doing that. But really, I, I took I took my love of and passion for the fitness industry and, and I went and I worked at URSA, the International Health Rack and Sports Club Association on policy and health promotion for over a decade. And while I was there, I was doing more and more work getting uh, the URSA Foundation off the ground. And the URSA Foundation is the 501c3 um, affiliated with, with URSA and really has a mission and vision of helping health and fitness centers open their doors to people with disability and disease. And so I was thinking a lot more about, yes, healthcare and health and fit, fitness integration, but also about accessibility and expanding access to health and fitness center programming and services. Because I'm so passionate about physical activity and movement and exercise. And I think that what health and fitness centers and fitness professionals offer is incredibly valuable in helping people move along their health and fitness journey. So thinking about the fact that only 20% of the population accesses those programming and services. So how can we do more? So as I was doing that work, I recognized that in order to be able to have more of an impact, I needed to go back to school. I'm a lifelong learner. I any excuse to go back to school, but I I really um, I uh, wanted. What time frame is this, by the way? About what yeah. year is it? Yeah. So this was um, 2017. So okay. 20, 2017, I went back and uh, to school. I got my doctor of public health. And uh, I really wanted to have a grounding in public health knowledge. I wanted to understand the language of public health so I could talk to the medical, public health, health and fitness communities. And so there were two really pivotal 
experiences in, in my uh, doctoral journey. The, the first was when I did uh, field, doctoral field work out at Intermountain Healthcare, which is a health system out in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I spent time there as a uh, researcher, a principal investigator, working on a project that would connect healthcare and social services. So it would bring healthcare out into communities to address food insecurity and uh, housing instability and lack of access to transportation and yes, physical inactivity and really understand people's lived experience, what were their barriers to achieving their best health outcomes. And by bringing healthcare out into communities, could we improve health outcomes and reduce healthcare spending? And so I spent time doing that. So that is really where I got very excited about bringing healthcare out into communities to improve health outcomes. That was my first really pivotal experience. My second was my doctoral research, which you so kindly yeah. spent time so this, with. So this isn't that long ago. No, no. I um, my uh, my doctoral thesis was written 2019 to 2020 yeah and i spent i spent 10 months evaluating an exercise referral network that is a community hospital in new england uh, which has since been acquired by a much larger healthcare system at the time when i was evaluating the exercise referral network it was a network that had been in place for about 10 years. And when I was doing my program evaluation, they were doing about um, 38, 30, 35 referrals um, a month. So significant amounts. And it really gave me the opportunity to survey healthcare providers and interview healthcare providers. Yeah. So cool. Sur survey the other members of the care team that worked with the hospital affiliated health and fitness center. So I was able to survey and interview health coaches, personal trainers, registered dietitians, all working together as a wellness team and really try to understand the entire system. Yes. And I think a lot of my focus, my background is policy I'm um, and systems change. And so I'm very focused on um, really trying to enact large scale change. And so I, I spent time evaluating the network. I did focus a lot on barriers, absolutely. In fact, when I sit on panels, I presented at uh, American College of Sports Medicine during uh, during the pandemic, I think it was 2021, and I sat on a panel and I was the barriers person. So I went first and then Good. the others went after. But really in my research, I I tried to understand what were barriers to providers talking with their patients about physical activity, writing a prescription for physical yes. activity. I love it and then referring their patients to either the hospital affiliated health and fitness center. And that fitness center had a dedicated wellness center that um, ran several programs, uh, a weight management program, um, a cancer recovery program, a uh, overall holistic, behavior change, lifestyle change program. And so patients could be re referred into one of those programs and work with the care team that I was able to actually interview and survey. Or the providers could refer patients outside that closed loop system yes. and could refer them to a community-based health and fitness center um like planet fitness for example so i was able to really drill down on barriers to physicians referring out to community-based health and fitness centers and there was definitely a 
a, a difference in comfort level in referring to the hospital affiliated health and fitness center versus the community based. And yep. so that started me on a path and a journey because again, my background is, is doing a lot of work with commercial health and fitness centers. How could I help commercial health and fitness centers address and, and bridge that, what I term the, the trust gap Yes. Um, and that physicians were much more likely to trust the hospital affiliated fitness professionals versus the, the community based fitness professionals. So how could the community based fitness professionals take the steps that they needed to take in order to become a trusted referral source? So I actually put together a whole roadmap for community based health and fitness centers really focused on building trust and um yeah i can i can talk more about that but we we can go in all sorts of directions so so where do you want to yeah. that that's a little bit of the the background that led up to wh where i am now and and where i am now is in so i defended my dissertation in march of 2020 and as part of my defense and as part of my project, I actually launched my company, Move to Live More. And I launched my company because I didn't really see that anyone was doing what I really wanted to do, which was to okay. connect not only healthcare and health and fitness, but also that communities component yes. and bringing healthcare and health and fitness out into communities in order to expand. I got very focused on this 80% of the population that doesn't access health and fitness centers. So how can we do more to get people moving in all different types of environments? So I got very interested in the built environment and walkability and um, bike lanes and um, re really barriers to people moving in communities. So that that was a really big component and and what I wanted to make sure that I included when I was launching my company. So Move to Live More has been in existence now since J January 2020. And I work with client all different types of clients. I work with talk, talk about that real quick. I would love for the viewers to know, you know, what you're doing at this national level and, and like who you're sitting at the table with and who you're, you know, consulting for and stuff like that. By the way, most people looking for the services of a fitness professional are really just looking for more information on how to get started on the right path, not to pay for training sessions every week for months or years on end. For the 60 to 70% of people with chronic disease and or joint pain, they're also looking for someone who can help them develop a clinically safe, individualized exercise program that takes their conditions into consideration. If a cost-friendly, Virtual medical fitness service designed to get you started on a safe program is something that interests you. You can find more information at mrfinstitute.org slash services. We staff only degreed kinesiologists and exercise physiologists, and we'll even work with your healthcare providers in the design of your exercise program. Check out our website and send us an email to set up your initial consultation. Yeah, so I work with... A lot of what I've done is um, during during the pandemic, I actually uh, consulted to and advised my city, the city of Somerville on COVID response. So a little bit of a detour, which isn't as much of a detour because it's it's helped me understand how to advise municipalities on community and, and public health. And, and there was a strong connection of healthcare to social services in that piece. So um, leveraging that experience and thinking through how to help communities um, address healthy eating and active living for their populations. So I consult to municipalities, I consult to state governments. I'm doing a really interesting project now with um, the state government here in Massachusetts, which is uh, focused on connecting healthcare and social services by prescribing 
art and culture and very yeah, much okay. based on the prescription of physical activity in that model. Yeah. So how do we how do we prescribe all different types of things, including physical activity? Um, I also do I work at all um, across the life and health span. So I have clients that um, have fitness programs for older adults uh, focused on strength training. And um, I have a client that focuses on cancer recovery and um, exercise oncology. So a little bit older populations, but I also, uh, I work with the Daily Mile, which is an in-school physical activity intervention for elementary school students. So bringing it down to to yeah. um, the beginning of the life and health. Yeah, that really is the whole lifespan. Yeah, and how can we instill, um, not only instilling healthy habits in, in kids that will last a lifetime, but leveraging um, the school environment and um, building in community and social support, which is a huge piece of, of behavior change in the work I do. Uh, I also work with uh, commercial health and fitness centers to help them um, be seen as essential in their communities. So how do they forge relationships with healthcare providers to get exercise referrals? How do they forge relationships with schools to get the kids in their communities more active? How do they forge relationships with corporations to run corporate wellness programs? Um, and how do they forge relationships with um, the media so that we're raising the visibility of, of um, A, the importance and of being active and B, um, uh, raising the visibility of places where people can, can be physically active. And then probably the last piece um, that I feel I should mention, I, I do work with the um, uh, with the Coalition for the Registry of Exercise Professionals really raising the credibility of uh, registered exercise professionals and the importance of having um, that, that expertise, the expertise of exercise professionals um, be recognized and valued by the general public, by policymakers, um by people who are seeking to embark on a on physical activity behavior change and and need that expertise and what role can exercise professionals play and you and i know so well how important that role is out of doubt you know man there's like i have like 10 questions i want to ask you all at the exact same time i'm trying to figure out in my mind how to parse this out um so first I'll ask a question, but then I want to say a couple other things before you respond. My question is, um, I, I'm, you know, I live in New York City. I've been a continuing education provider for the National Academy of Sports Medicine for a decade. And as you probably know, I'm sure you know, New York City is just a mecca of gyms and health clubs, Equinox and Crunch and LA Fitness and New York Sports Clubs and Synergy and on and on. And I have presented over the last decade many many times across you know the spectrum of of gyms and health clubs and and one of the things you touched on was that yeah there's just such a disconnect like you know even between between so here we are in this major metropolitan area with all these gyms and health clubs and then all these hospital systems and private practices and it's just disconnected and it's frustrating and that and so I'm, that's part of the reason why i'm so passionate about this as well and then you'll even see and I'm not going to name names, but you'll see health club systems with, for example, physical therapy facilities within it, and yet mm -hmm. they're still disconnect, even though it's right there within it. And so I guess my question to you, I don't know if we really have time to go into detail about this, or maybe we do, but my question to you is, um, since this is something that you hit upon, where can, because I get questions all the time when I'm out and about, and even for myself, um, who are the gatekeepers? What is the best way to connect um, gyms and health clubs or even just independent trainers with your local clinicians because they're so busy and they don't have time, like all these other barriers, busy, don't have time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, or do you have resources that someone could go to 
um, that provide answers to these questions. Yeah. So yes, there's a disconnect. Um, yes, the right hand is not talking to the left hand. And, and how do we address that? And we're trying through the physical activity alliance we're trying to address it at a systems level now yes. it really comes down to individual health and fitness centers individual health and fitness professionals doing the legwork to yes. educate and raise awareness among individual healthcare providers and we we keep alluding to barriers the the barriers that i found so so first we need the providers talking with their patients about physical activity and the physicians told me the barriers to them doing that is time they don't have yes. enough time in their to office visit tools and technology so quite literally having um an electronic health record that supports them asking their patient about their um the the days per week and minutes per day yes. of physical activity that they're doing are they doing strength training and um and the the in in my case in my research i actually found physicians who were like looking for handouts and printouts that they could yes. give to their patients and and then and literally printing it out so that they could walk out the door with it and then uh time tools training to, uh, training really the fact that not not enough physicians are are trained in medical school. So trying to address medical school education and, and continuing education. And then uh, trust, which we've alluded to a little bit, and, and then cost. And so being reimbursed for those conversations and then taking it one step further to actually write a prescription and then yes. refer, refer out to someone with um the expertise to to help patients embark on a an exercise program and so what can health and fitness professionals do i i mentioned this 10-step roadmap that i put together where we as fitness professionals can can quite literally take the time to educate clinicians about what it is we do why yes. why do we what expertise do we have? How can we help their patients? Why should they trust us to send their patients to and, and knowing that we're going to take good care of their patients and, and um, help them achieve the health outcomes that, that clearly the clinician wants them to achieve and the, and the patient as well. And what role can we play in, in translating the, knowledge we know that exercise is good for us it's having Absolutely. that it's it's actually translating that knowledge into action and and what role can exercise professionals play in that so what are our credentials what's our expertise what, what type of populations are we trained and um to, to work with, how would we work with their patients? What what equipment would we use? What um, what space would we be working in? And so really educating clinicians, raising awareness about our expertise and the infrastructure. And then you mentioned physical therapy. I really see physical therapy as a wonderful, we talked about building bridges. I see physical therapy as a wonderful way to build bridges because Absolutely. clinicians understand physical therapy. There is, a, there is a reimbursement model for it. So they're comfortable referring to physical therapy and then we can partner with physical therapy to have a warm handoff of those patients who complete their physical therapy programming and then start with them on on exercise programming in in that community based setting and 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 continue to work with them. So I see a great opportunity for physical therapy to play a role in that that warm. It is about a warm handoff. It really is. You know, you hit on so many things. I'd, I'd like for the viewers to uh, 
So you you hit on so many things that the Physical Activity Alliance is doing. Yeah. And I don't know that you've um, mentioned your specific role. Um, and so uh, if you'll just briefly mention your role with the Physical Activity Alliance, because I'd like the viewers to be aware that a lot, pretty much all of what you mentioned is happening in the background. And yeah. um, right, I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. And, and, and maybe it'll ease some frustrations or whatever. And maybe even if you can bridge that with your article that you co-authored, and I think it was published back in uh, 2021, the um, Physical Activity Assessment Prescription and Referral in U.S. Healthcare, How Do We Make This a Standard of Clinical Practice? One of the things I love about that, one of the many things I love about that article is the continuum moving this way for yes. referral receipt, uh, Rattler receiver, as opposed to their traditional totem pole that seems to dominate, um, you know, this uh, this bridge. So, if you'll just kind of briefly talk about what your role is with PAA and 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 maybe kind of bridge it with that real quick. Yeah. So I'm happy to talk here. I'm just taking, making sure I I touch on a few things. So the Physical Activity Alliance is a an organization made up of 17 organizations, American College of Sports Medicine, American College of uh, Lifestyle Medicine, ACLM, ACSM are, are, are part of it. Move to Live More is part of it. Um, Tivity Health is part of it. All the um, exercise uh, professional organizations, uh, ACE, um, NASA. A, right. uh, APTA is part of it. AMSSM, <laughs> like the big, you know, this is, this is so off, bridges the whole spectrum. Absolutely. And it was so important to us uh, as an organization to be able to speak with a one voice, a unified voice, and really create a uh, community, an inclusive community of physical activity organizations that are all working to uh get people moving and to make physical activity uh, accessible and uh, a part of everyday Americans' lives. And um, we are very much focused on systems level and policy change, as you mentioned. And, and that's really how I got involved with the Physical Activity Alliance. It is all the barriers that I addressed in my research and all the really the, the 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 vision i had of an ideal world where every single clinician talks to every single patient yes. about yes. physical activity and then yes. has the tools and technology with an electronic health record to be able to capture the physical activity um, information and then to be able to refer out to write a prescription and and a, a huge driver for my work is is and you you mentioned that physical activity continuum a huge driver of my work is the fact that in my research i found that okay even if the clinician talked to their patient about physical activity and wrote a prescription or a referral, there was they didn't know what happened after their patients walked yes. out the door. Like 28% of clinicians responded, I don't know when I asked them if their patients followed through on the prescription or referral. So they just sort of went out into- The abyss the abyss exactly <laughs> and so the ability to know is really important and so i think that's where the physical activity alliance work is so important because our it's time to move campaign really works to make physical activity assessment prescription and referral a standard of care in the u.s yes. healthcare system and which includes exchange of information and data and an electronic health record system that capture that uses a standardized measure for physical activity assessment captures the information and then 
exchanges that information. So if it goes out to a referral goes out to a community a community-based health and fitness professional, they would be able to capture the information of the exercise program and feed it back to the clinician. So the next time the patient comes in, the the clinician could say, how is, how is your exercise program yes. continuing? I understand that you're doing this, this, and this, and you've been doing this, this, and this for this amount of time. Um, and the, 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 to, the ability to close that feedback loop is really important. And the, in my doctoral thesis, the exercise referral network that I was looking at, they were actually going through a big electronic health record migration change while I was uh, reviewing it. And the ability for a health coach and a registered dietitian and a personal trainer to have real time communication That's right. with a clinician to, to get as much information as possible about the patient coming to them and then to feed the information back to the clinician is absolutely critical. And if you're outside that loop, you're working blind. That's right. And so that if uh, the the work with it's time to move, it's a multi year effort, and we're very much in the weeds right now, where we're creating an implementation guide that w then goes through a review process and a balloting process. And once we have this implementation guide, then we need to raise awareness among clinicians and healthcare systems so they use the implementation guide. So we're still a ways away, um, but we are moving toward that that physical activity continuum that you described where we've got every every clinician talking about it, every patient following through, and then the clinician knowing that they followed through. Yeah. So I'm so glad that you said, and, and by the way, your role currently with the PAA is you are the current president, correct? I am the current president. I started my uh, term as president uh, January 1, and I'll uh, be president for this year. And it's a, it's a wonderful and weighty uh, responsibility and opportunity. I think it's, it's really, um, it's, it's really critical. You we know so well the the physical and mental health benefits of being physically active it's it 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 feels like a no-brainer but but raising the visibility and awareness of the physical activity community and trying to move the dial move the needle on getting people active you and i know the statistics what are we we're at like 23 percent of the u.s population that that meets the physical activity guidelines so a lot of the uh a lot of the physical activity alliance work is is in partnership of course, with the 17 uh, member organizations, but also with uh, the CDC and the Move Your Way campaign and, and their, um, their goal of getting 20, 27 million uh, Americans moving by, I, I hope I don't butcher this, 20, uh, 2027, I, I, 27 million, yeah. 2027, I think that's yeah. right. And so, um, and, and another key piece that I should really mention, um, the physical activity, we have the physical activity guidelines, ev evidence-based, science-backed, and then we have the National Physical Activity Plan, which is really a roadmap for bringing the physical activity guidelines to life. And um, the National Physical Activity Plan falls under the Physical Activity Alliance. So all the work that's being, um done and really important the communications work the education work um there are different sectors and committees that really make the national physical activity plan come to life and so that is uh we've got the it's time to move campaign and, and we've also got the the national physical activity plan yeah. i am so glad that you mentioned all this and i really wanted people to hear this so they're aware that all this stuff is happening and it's going to happen and as far as making these connections, um, 
I'm aware of it because through the ACLM, I, you know, got involved with the um, assessment prescription and referral working group, the clinic, uh, clinic to community working group. So I get to see a lot of the stuff that you're talking about going on in the background. And, and also I wanted to mention that I've experienced, like I, I was in a Mount Sinai system um, here in New York city for 10 years. So I, and so I know what it's like to be, like this particular facility was not, it was a satellite location of Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. And um, we had two floors and the floor I worked on, you know, direct contact on a daily basis with the clinicians and what a huge difference that made with referrals. And then, right. And then on the other floor was family medicine, internal medicine, et cetera. And while they referred, it, it, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And, uh, and you, you hit on those things. So I've absolutely been on both sides of that fence and have experienced the difference and how, how important, um, cause prior to, I was 10 years in my career when I got involved with this, um, facility and I had never been in a facility where I had direct access to the electronic medical record. And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden I had direct access to it. And what a huge difference that made for me to be able to tap into the subjective notes the clinicians were saying about the patients and learn things about the patients before I even set up my initial consultation with them. I was already learning things about them through the EMR, through conversations with clinicians, and then I'd go have the consultation, which just made me a much more informed fitness professional. So everything you're saying, I just, I'm just glad that you mentioned all that because I do want people watching this to know that how important everything that you're saying is and that they're and that you're leading the charge with um you know with these ha things happening and yeah we're several ways away we got if, correct me if i'm wrong but we have organizations like the american college of sports medicine they seem to be leading the charge with this um qualified healthcare provider movement um and and um, reimbursement and uh the, the accreditation going on at the higher institution level colleges and universities with the ACSM, NSCA, et cetera. So there's all these movements going on, which are hopefully going to merge several years from now and bring to life everything. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's what I'm seeing. And, and it will bring to life what you've been saying. Yeah. There, are, there are a lot of different initiatives, as you say, not knowledge is power. And yes. we want to, the, the most informed credentialed, respected exercise professional working hand in hand with other members of the care team, the health coach, the registered dietitian, um, all working together with the clinician in order to help patients achieve their best possible health. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, while I could ask you about 10,000 more questions and keep you for another six hours to be respectful <laughs> of your time. Um, we will wrap this one up um, and hopefully uh, we can have a part two sometime uh, in the future. But but um, as we wrap it up, I wanted to uh, ask how listeners and viewers might be able to follow you, your resources, learn more about your work and, and all the topics we've been discussing. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, so people can find me there. Uh, Move to Live More uh, at Move to Live More is also on um, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, the Physical Activity Alliance. I love the uh, tagline the of uh, Physical Activity Alliance because it's Move with Us. So um, coming together as an inclusive community so people can find a physical activity alliance. Um, I should, I think it's paamovewithus.org. Yes. I'll yes. make sure I link all this stuff. Okay, great. Well. Yeah. And um, yeah, I really uh, encourage health and fitness professionals. We are creating a, a movement to raise up health and fitness professionals and raise up awareness about um, health and fitness professionals expertise and and credentials so i think that's a really important piece and not to and we can't emphasize too much really why we're doing this because we are 
bringing the healing and preventive power of physical activity to more and more people, which is really why we all got into this exactly. industry. We're so passionate. We, we, we believe, we believe in the power of movement yep. and we want others to experience the power of movement as well so that that is really what this is all about dr bantham i you know i first of all just really appreciate your time i am so impressed and um and can't thank you enough for all the work you're doing you have my dream job and uh <laughs> um and so, so again thank you so much for taking the time um to let me pick your brain a little bit and like i said maybe uh Maybe we'll have a part two uh, down the road, but th thanks again. I really appreciate it. No, a part two would be great. I'm so honored that you invited <laughs> me on. So, and I really appreciate having this conversation with like with a like-minded, passionate Absolutely. person who clearly has a like-minded, passionate audience. Yep. Thank you so much. Take care and I'll talk to you soon. I hope you enjoyed listening and found this information insightful please go to mrfinstitute.org and our YouTube channel at the Medical Fitness Podcast for more information on how to learn more about Dr. Bantham, the organization she's involved with, her own podcast series, and how to follow her on social media. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.